Hello, and welcome to .edu, the Higher Education Policy Podcast from the American Council on Education. And a little bit later in the episode, we're going to be joined by Nadine Fareed Johnson, who is PEN America's Washington director. Uh, but before we get to that conversation, which sadly I was not able to participate in, but was uh, ably managed by my colleagues, I want to say hi to those same colleagues, Mushtaq Gunja and Sarah Spritzer. Hi, how are you guys? Hey, John. We know um, we know you're too busy for us now that you're the new senior vice president for government relations. We I understand. Am. You don't have time for the little people. I'm trying to cut out all my social engagements, starting with those I have with you, Sarah. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, Sarah. And happy State of the Union Day to all those who celebrate. And because you two are super nerds, I know that both of you celebrate. So, uh, of course. Ha happy Very holidays to you. So. Thank, Thank you. you. A day like this only comes around once a year. <laughs> uh, there was a there was a year. I think it was 2015. Um, where I had written a paragraph that we were like desperately hoping was going to get into the State of the Union, President Obama's State of the Union. But we had no idea whether it was. And, you know, it started like with a paragraph that was probably like five sentences, and then it got boiled down to two sentences. Then it was like a fragment of like a sentence. And then it didn't make it into the State of the Union. So oh. I watched for like whatever, mm. like 75 minutes, like with bated breath, really hoping that like, <laughs> and nothing. Um, so... Uh, do we want to bet who? Do we want to bet who's going to be the cabinet member that that is in the undisclosed location? That's always my favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. Marty Walsh. Now that he's yeah, right. Kobe. The NHL Players <laughs> the Association NHL. head, right? Not even the NHL. The NHL Players Association. That that is the. I got to say, maybe the oddest transition out of a secretary, cabinet level secretary position that I've at least heard of. I don't know if, if Mushtaq. You've heard of any others, but man, it didn't see that coming anyway. <laughs> Good for Secretary Walsh. I think he's he must have taken a job that he really wanted and is back in Boston. So I'm happy yeah. for him. There you go. So friends, what is, should we talk a little State of the Union? I mean, do we expect yeah. higher ed issues? Um, what's What do we sort of expect on our higher ed or what do we expect on our State of the Union bingo card tonight? You know, uh, as we sit here, it's like 2.33 I'm not really expecting really any mentions of higher ed. The, the, the thing I think is most likely top of the list there would be either loan forgiveness, right, which is tied up at the Supreme Court right now, oral arguments at the end of this month. Uh, you know, I think the president thinks that's a winning issue. So drawing a contrast between him and the Republicans, you know, maybe that gets in there. But I'm sort of mindful of your point, Mushtaq, about started with two sentences, went to one sentence, became three words. It's really hard to get things into the State of the Union, and this is one where there's not really anything to announce, so maybe that doesn't make it in. The other one is maybe, either directly or indirectly, uh, minority-serving institutions, something that the administration has given a lot of time and attention to. They have put some money behind, some effort and resources into. Uh, you know, It's a good one. to It's bipartisan support for those institutions, great institutions. Uh, so that might be one where he could get a you know collapse from both sides of the aisle. So... Those, that's what I'd guess, but I think usually at this time of day, usually, frankly, by yesterday, if we've got higher ed stuff in there, we start to hear about it, and, and I've heard mm -hmm. zero. If they need a fragment, I'm sure there's a fragment of a sentence from 2015 sort of floating around the West Wing. So <laughs> Well written, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> that they should have to use. Well, I do think that on my higher ed bingo card, I definitely have China and perhaps mm -hmm. Spy Balloon. Um, I am curious whether or not the president will talk about, you know, the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act, which passed last year. So it just passed last year. But I think they consider it to be, um, you know, a real bipartisan win. Um, and it obviously was focused on competitiveness with China. And so whether or not that gets referenced, not sure. You know, the other thing I, I feel could get referenced, right, is sort of the the transition out of COVID. Right. Yeah. Um, and the end of the COVID emergency. Yeah. I mean, John, sir, are you hearing anything about that? Well, I think people know the administration declared last week that they will be ending the pandemic national emergency on May 11th. Uh, kind of interestingly, I don't know that they really wanted to do that, but they saw a vote coming in Congress that would have forced their hand either in terms of publicly opposing it and vetoing it. Uh, or something that might have passed that would have forced them to do it immediately. So this was kind of a compromise. I think they probably would have preferred to push it back a little bit more, but 
uh, that's where we're going with it. Uh, you know, it would be kind of interesting. You wonder if Biden will take this as a moment to say, you know, we've turned the corner right now. He's they've got great job growth numbers. Uh, they've so far avoided, you know, a recession. Inflation is still kind of an issue, but that seems to be softening a little bit. Um, maybe that's what he says, right? Like we've come through it now and the economy is in a good place and we're ready to move forward. And I'm proud to, you know, do X, Y and Z as part of this next stage of, you know, America's greatness or whatever. Um I could see that. Yeah. As someone who just had COVID for the fourth time, I'm not really sure if we're actually out of the emergency, but, you know, trying to track what has actually like the, the flexibilities and the rules that were extended or changed due to the COVID emergency and understanding like what's going to have to happen after May 11th. Like, I don't think it'll be seismic, but for our institutions, you know, we're starting to think, obviously, John, that means that they likely won't extend the student loan repayment pause again, right? Because that right. repayment pause was done under the COVID emergency. You know, for our international students, we had some flexibilities, such as like, you know, the ability to take more courses online um, as an international student, but in the U.S. And that flexibility is going to go away at the end of the academic year. And I think our institutions were preparing for that, but you know, tracking those across the various agencies. I mean, we've been in this for three years, right? I can't remember how long. It yeah. seems like 50 years, but there's a lot that that subtle, subtle flexibilities. And then I guess I'm also interested in seeing like what might continue. Like we saw some flexibilities offered regarding uh, visa interviews for our international students. And is there some way the Department of State can extend those past the COVID emergency because it worked really well. Um, mm. You know, it was it was only for a small group of international students. Is there some way that it can be extended? Yeah, and Sarah, I really like that you talked about that across different agencies because I think, you know, for higher ed institutions, the waivers through the education department, and they're all over the place, like a lot of different things they got waivers for, mostly to ease the transition to online in a hurry and and, you know, things like that. For a lot of those, the department's actually been pretty clear about how that will work, right? If you are mid-semester, the waiver doesn't have to expire immediately on May 11th, mm -hmm. right? You can carry that out. Pretty reasonable, you know, processes in place. Around, you know, the southern border, or State Department actions, other agencies, I think it's a lot less clear what exactly mm -hmm. the impact will be of different policies. Uh, I think there's a lot of concern, frankly, about you know, come May 11th, are we going to be prepared to make the transition to the non-waiver uh, world? And, you know, in Ed, frankly, you know, still concerns, lots of unanswered questions, not saying there won't be bugs or flaws. We've been doing this for three years almost at this point. Um, but, you know, seems like they're slightly better off than some of their colleagues across the administration. And I will say, you know, the administration in announcing that also made it very clear, it's not going to change student loan repayment. That's still going to start June 30th, which is effectively actually August 30th. Um, it's not going to affect forgiveness. I mean, the Supreme Court may affect forgiveness, but mm -hmm. the end of the national emergency won't. You know, the big things they have said, they're going to go forward, even if they were frankly designed as emergency responses for the pandemic. Pandemic might be over. The proposals are going to carry forward. Yeah, and the Supreme Court is hearing that student loan case on it's February 28th. John it is. Sarah. It is February 28th. I'm excited to see it. The House Republicans sent an amicus brief this week. Um, oh, yeah. I saw Virginia Fox was quoted uh, in, a, in an interview saying that it was uh, the bill was totally or the action was totally illegal, mm -hmm. which I love because I, I don't no think you need measures. the modifier there. <laughs> Either it's illegal or it's not. You, Really can't be totally illegal, but it's such a good. lawyer opinion. I, you know, I like a little questionable legality. That's a you know, there's some yeah. gray area, some middle ground, right? <laughs> the administration you know, certainly speaking, does. <laughs> yeah, speaking of Chairwoman Fox, she's having her first hearing tomorrow for um, Ed and Workforce, and it's going to be on education in crisis. It's going to cover K twelve and um, and post secondary education, and I. I think one of the focuses will be on free inquiry on our college campuses. So it's great that we're talking to Nadine today so I can really bone up on the topic before I go to this hearing. Yeah, it's a it's a interesting slate of witnesses too. I mean, interesting in that there's not a lot of information about exactly what the focus will be. The write-up 
was pretty negative about both K-12 and higher ed. Uh, clearly, the title American Education in Crisis doesn't imply that they think things are in good shape. Uh, but you've got you know, a, a school choice advocate. You have uh, someone who is the head of a community and technical college system. So, you know, clearly some workforce tie-ins. You have a uh, president, uh, Scott Pulsifer, president of Western Governors University that we know well here at AC, who will be testifying at the higher ed level. Uh, so really, the Republicans have put you know, sort of one witness from each level. So they are looking at a very comprehensive kind of approach to education. Uh, the Democrats, uh, the minority witness, they have Jared Polis, former member of the House of Representatives, now the governor of Colorado. When he was in the House, he was a pretty outspoken advocate of public education. So clearly there in a lot of ways to, you know, I think if you, particularly at the K-12 level, he was a little bit more uh, complicated positions, harder to pin down sort of in one area or the other on higher ed. He had, he had a lot of interesting viewpoints, um, but certainly on the K-12 side, you know what you're going to get from him. You know, actually, I think the, the witnesses are uh, are interesting because I think that they in some ways demonstrate what is, I think, a core strength of American higher education, which is the diversity of our system, right? I mean, if yeah. you want a particular type of career education, we've got that for you. If you want um, a more... Uh, a little bit more of a four year, but straight to career, you know, Scott and Western governors and others, like you you can do that. If you want a more classical liberal arts education, you can go to many institutions. And, you know, it's actually a decent segue to, I, I think a conversation we're about to have with Nadine about what what's happening at New College and the mm -hmm. sort of public liberal arts education in, in Florida. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm just troubled at the idea that we're, we're in crisis somehow in higher education when, you know, in some ways I think, I think our institutions, especially in the wake of the pandemic, have done just such a nice job of offering all sorts of different entry points and off ramps. Can we do better? Obviously. Are we in crisis? Like, I don't know. I yeah. I think I would I mean, disagree with, with Chairwoman Fox. I feel like uh, I agree with you entirely. I feel like at any point in the last 25 years, you could find somebody saying American education is in crisis, right? Like this is not there is nothing unique about the position we're in other than, to your point, we just came out of the pandemic, which was a really clarion, you know, it was a really strong moment for American higher education. We weathered the pandemic, quite frankly, far better than other sectors of the education world in mm -hmm. terms of uh, how we responded to the pandemic, how quickly we transitioned, how well we served our students, how, frankly, efficiently we managed the federal funds that were made available. Like, this is actually a good time to look at higher education from my perspective, because we've done remarkably well. Like you said, clearly lots of room for improvement, lots of different areas, ways you can be better. But that, you know, I'm less worried about a crisis here and more worried about, you know, what what is a good path forward? And, you know, hopefully we'll get some of that from the hearing tomorrow too. Yeah. It's good witnesses. Yep. Agreed. Well, we have a lot to talk about, or I should say you both have a lot to talk about with <laughs> our guest, uh, Nadine Faree Johnson. That will be right back after the break. I myself am looking forward to hearing it. So uh, have fun with that. And we are back. And we are joined today by a very special guest, Nadine Faree Johnson, who is Penn America's Washington director. Nadine uh, has had just a stellar career thinking about teaching about uh, working on whole issue, a whole set of issues sort of related to democracy. Uh, Nadine previously served as executive director at the ACLU of Kansas. She's an attorney by training. She's been a professor of many things, but especially of uh, constitutional law at Gonzaga. We are so lucky to have you, Nadine. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure, Ms. Talk. Thank you so much. Um, Nadine, uh, I I'm quite familiar with PEN America's work. I've, I've used it quite a bit in my career, but for those in our audience who don't know uh, much about PEN America, would you tell us just a little bit about what the organizations, what, what you do and what, what the organization does and what you do there? Yes, absolutely. Um, so PEN America is a 100 year old organization that is devoted to the intersection of literature and human rights. And we do that to defend free expression both in the US and around the world. We've been doing this, as I said, for 100 years, and we are working not only in the US, but also abroad, looking at what happens with political prisoners, authoritarian governments, effects on writers, journalists, bloggers, others who are punished for their speech. In the United States, we also have a very robust education team that focuses on campus free expression and the K through 12 experience as well. 
So Nadine, that's a really wide swath of of issues to try and cover. And um, obviously in the in the world of higher education, this is a very, very busy time. But can you talk a bit about how Penn America is engaging right now on issues impacting our college campuses? We've been doing quite a bit of research, particularly in the legislative space, trying to analyze what is happening across the country, particularly in the past couple of years, with respect to bills at the state level that purport to seek to control what's happening in the higher ed space. And we have seen this really become quite a movement, really starting in 2021, in terms of looking at efforts to control curriculum, efforts to control institutional institutional autonomy, and efforts to what really amount to chilling academic freedom and speech on campuses. And why why do you think 2021? Is there something about that year or something that happened that caused PEN America to kind of look more closely at these issues? Yes, we actually saw an absolute explosion of bills across the United States that were working to seek to prohibit what they're called divisive concepts. And these are essentially looking at what happens with teachers and training operate tra- trainers, excuse me, operating in K to 12 schools in public universities and in workplace settings. And what we saw was that between January and September of that year, 24 legislatures across the US introduced 54 separate bills that were intended to restrict teaching and training in those institutions. And since then, the numbers have just been absolutely staggering. We've seen 193 what we call educational gag order bills that were introduced in 41 legislatures since January of 2021. Several of these have become law. And what we're seeing just in this nascent legislative session in 2023, already 19 laws have been introduced in 11 states that are focused solely on higher education. So the trend is really continuing in force. Yeah, yikes. Um, so Nadine, you use the term divisive concepts. I think you also use the term educational gag orders. I, I wonder what are the types of bills, what are the types of issues that are included in that umbrella uh, for PEN America? We use the term educational gag orders because these bills are designed or appear to be designed to chill academic and educational discussions and to impose a government dictate on what teaching and learning can happen in the institutions. These bills target discussions of race and racism, gender and American history. Oftentimes you will hear, especially legislators refer to the the concept of CRT, saying that should not be taught in schools. It's expanded now to include gender studies in many places. So while most of these bills have continued to target teaching about race, there is also a growing number that is focused on LGBTQ plus identities and a plethora now what we're seeing of several bills that are emulating what we saw in Florida last year in terms of the don't say gay bill. And Nadine, you talked about the number of of bills being introduced on these topics. Is this something that you're seeing across all the states in the United States or is this like you know, coalescing in the South? Is it only in red states? You know, where where are people seeing this kind of legislation being introduced on the state level? We are seeing this introduced all across the country. At last count, it was 41 different states. So it really is something that is sweeping the country. And we've actually looked at this at PEN America as part of a bigger picture, a bigger movement to really control what's happening in the classroom. If you look at our work on book bans, in addition to educational gag orders and seeing what's happening in the, really the K through 20 sphere, looking all the way from kindergarten through, through university, there really is what seems to be and an ed, what we're calling an ed scare, a really mm. an, an, an effort to really kind of incite a moral panic and to criticize and, and put a critical and closed lens on what's happening in the classroom all the way from the spectrum from, from early education through the university. And, you know, it seems, I mean, I can remember even when I was growing up, like book bans in the K-12 classrooms, those types of actions, concerns about what children were being exposed to, especially at the public school system. Why, you know, is it the same? Is it the same concerns at our institutions of higher education or is it slightly different, do you think? Are, are they the same exact issues and are they playing out the same ways? Because obviously the K-12 and post-secondary education 
it's very different. You're not required to go to post-secondary education. We have private and public institutions and, and um, you know, they're governed in different ways. So can you talk a bit about any differences you're seeing between those two spheres? We're actually seeing now an effort to replicate what was being introduced previously in the K through 12 sphere in the higher ed sphere. And that is particularly concerning because of what higher education means to this country. Higher education is one of the last bastions of free inquiry and open conversation in our society. And as we become more and more polarized, attacks on the autonomy of those colleges and university universities do really constitute what we would call a crisis of campus free expression, and frankly, of the democracy that it that it serves. You know, it's, it's interesting, Sarah, because you know certainly I think K twelve and higher ed are governed differently. You have a choice on the the higher ed side, but you know what's interesting about it, I think, is that you know in this world in which we see sort of more and more dual enrollment schools, right, advanced placement courses, right, like that line of like what is college or college level courses and like sort of what's taught in high school seems like a little blurry. I, I just think about this, Sarah, because we just had this um, this debate around uh, this African-American history class, this advanced placement class that mm -hmm. you know Florida has decided not to take. Nadine, is, are those the sorts of things that you're you're tracking over at uh, at Penn American? Yes, we are tracking all these different instances of efforts to try to control the curriculum, to change the curriculum, to have a say in terms of what is being taught in schools. Are, are there places in particular, or bills in in particular states that you're uh, particularly concerned about? Um, or is this just really a, a broad range? Actually both, because you can see that there are particular models that seem to beget progeny, if you will, um, from certain yeah. states. We are seeing quite a bit of activity in Florida, which I'm happy to discuss. We are maintaining an index of these bills because of the ubiquity of, of these efforts at, at the state legislative level, where, as I mentioned, just in the past few weeks since the 2023 session started, we've already seen 19 bills across 11 states looking at higher education. And there really is, there really does seem to be an effort to address what's happening at the college level and to encroach upon the independence of the institutions and of the, the professionals in the institutions. That's a that's a really helpful resource, Nadine, and we will definitely link to that in the show notes. Um, but you touched on this this kind of idea of model legislation and that some states are kind of watching other states that may be more active in this space. And obviously you mentioned Florida before. And just recently we saw some major changes at New College of Florida, which I think caused all of us to kind of sit up and take notice because they seemed... Um, pretty, pretty uh, on the extreme side, right? Like, like they're actually looking at the governance of an institution um, beyond, you know, what does governance have to do with critical race theory or the topics being taught? And, and so can you talk a little bit about why it's important to kind of watch that? And do you think that that's something that other governors or other states may try and replicate? And why is that important? It's a really good question. As you know, New College really has gone uh, undergone and is undergoing a complete overhaul at the hands of the leadership in Florida. Governor DeSantis appoint, appointed six new trustees to the New College board on January 6th. 25 days later, they all voted to fire the current president without cause during a meeting. And now the news has come out just yesterday that the former Florida Education Commissioner Richard Corcoran will be installed as the president as early as February 13th. There will be a meeting scheduled to review his contract. This happened really in the blink of an eye. These six new trustees came in. They were appointed, as I mentioned, by the governor and with the stated intent to, quote, overhaul and restructure the new College of Florida, which is, I, I should point out, a public liberal arts institution. What do you mean by restructure? The, the those are the words of of the of the leadership and of, of the new board right. really looking to my understanding our understanding is that they're looking to replicate what they see as a a model in universities looking at Hillsdale College which is a private religiously affiliated institution in Michigan 
And really what we're seeing here with this and why it matters is that this is an effort to substitute the dictates of elected officials for the autonomy of a higher education institution. If this succeeds, you are going to see the core freedom that is the vital prerequisite of academic research and teaching to be dissolved. And that should that should really concern anyone, irrespective of their political leaning, irrespective of their thoughts on what is taught at New College or any other institution. The fact that this would be a government overhaul of an institution of higher education should be disconcerting to anyone. Nadine, what's your sense of how the faculty are likely to react at places like New College, but others in which um, states are dictating, you know, what can be taught in the classroom? I mean, I, I uh, you you have been in the classroom. I I am uh, currently teaching a, a course. I mean, I, I just can't imagine that somebody could tell me, um, you know, you have to teach Rule 404 of the Federal Rules of Evidence, you know, in a particular way using particular examples, and you just have to stay away from, you know, mentioning the use of, I don't know, race or or gender identity or anything else. I mean, how, how are the faculty that you're talking to sort of thinking about all of this? You're absolutely right. It's almost unfathomable to think, to think about how professors are going to do their jobs day to day. At its base, this is having a chill effect, to put it mildly. Professors are not able to conduct their classes in the way that they see fit. And because these, these rules, these regulations, and, and to some extent where they've been passed, these actually these statutes, they're being interpreted quite broadly in a way that will actually further chill academic mm -hmm. freedom because professors don't really know at what point they will be crossing a line. Well, let me give you a couple of examples, if I could, about what some of, some of the actions that have been taken recently, particularly in Florida, that I think will serve to benefit those who, who wish to emulate it. Um, some of the language here is, is, I think, really chilling. They want to, quote, realign general education core courses to make sure they provide historically accurate, foundational, and career-relevant education to not mm -hmm. suppress or distort significant historical events or include a curriculum that teaches identity politics. They want to prohibit higher education institutions from using any funding, regardless of source, to support DEI, CRT, and other what they call discriminatory initiatives. So think about this from the from the classroom and administrative perspective. There really is an absolute lack of freedom in how courses and are conducted and how the institution is able to run itself. And so Mushak asked about you know the impact on the on the faculty. And that is incredibly chilling and, and worrisome that you're being told, you know, you can say this or you can't say this in a classroom. Um, what about the impact on, on college students? Like, what are you seeing from the PEN America perspective? There is absolutely a detrimental effect on college students, in part because they are caught in the middle of this. You have students here who have, or they're paying tuition to go to a school that had a, that that had what they thought was going to be the major they wanted to and which they wanted to focus or the atmosphere in which they wanted to engage. And that is being eroded from them in a way they, they have, they can't control. I think there's also something to be said about how these bills writ large, we're looking at them from higher ed, but also how it affects higher ed from the K through 12 um, angle. As these bills more and more seek to narrow what is taught, in middle school, in high school, that's also going to affect students' abilities to matriculate and to and to actually attend a university that uh, that they wish, and for the university to keep up its accreditation in a way that will satisfy the broader rules and regulations that govern that aspect of higher education. You know, it's it's really interesting, Nadine, because it feels to me you, you mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago. I think alluded to this worry about sort of a First Amendment freedom of speech sort of set of problems here, right? These these laws are written pretty vaguely, you know, that and it, they could affect a whole range of issues. You know, I think about that as I think about DEI sort of broadly, right? I mean, I hope and I, I think that most professors most of the time have at least the equity and inclusion parts of DEI like forefront all the time, right? They are trying to create welcoming, hospitable learning environments, right? So that students can learn in the classroom and feel comfortable in the classroom. Like, I don't even know how to pull DEI out of all mm -hmm. of the work that that our professors, 
you know, and, and frankly, all the people who are doing student advising, all the, the functions on campus, right? I mean, we are trying to help students um, learn, grow, you know, matriculate, and then uh, graduate from our institutions. I don't even know how you pull DEI out. And I, I feel like these bills are have significant constitutional problems, or at least overbreath problems. But I may just be editorializing. Nadine, what do you think about that? I think that they are certainly ripe for challenge in, in many respects. Look, we know from Supreme Court jurisprudence from years back, and you know this much talk, that, that the state is not to cast a pile of orthodoxy over the classroom. That is as true today as it was 60 years ago. And we should be respecting that in the classroom. We should also be respecting the fact that students have a right to access information. These bills taken together do not permit either of those either of, of those principles to be to be respected. And the other aspect here I think is really important is that as we look at these bills and the way that they are, as I mentioned, really targeting higher ed now, a lot of them are also looking at not only what professors can do in the classroom, but also the career path of these academics. A number of these bills are looking at the tenure review process. They are looking to prohibit tenure. They are talking about uh, allowing for a private right of action if a professor or something in a classroom comes up that that is seen to be ill-advised by by someone who is who is watching. These aspects of these bills really are working to crowd a professor in a, in a way that they really cannot do their job, nor do they know they're going to have a job in a particular time frame after this as, as, as well. You know, it's it's interesting, um, with Shaka and Nadine, that you mentioned the court cases, right, and that these are likely ripe for court cases. You know, at the end of the Trump administration, we saw a couple executive orders that were kind of on these very similar topics, maybe not as broad, you know, one on diversity, equity, and inclusion for organizations that receive federal funding, which obviously institutions of higher education um, would be would be included under. And there were you know, orders about not having any kind of DEI training that included critical race theory or a plethora of different topics that might be included in some sort of DEI, DEI training. And those were taken up by the courts. And, um, you know, obviously then when the Biden administration came in, they overturned that executive order. So I guess the court cases didn't go forward. But since you're both lawyers, I would ask you, how would this play out? Um, in the courts, and would they have to? Would would you have to sue on every single piece of this legislation, or could we say something more broadly about academic freedom and free inquiry at our institutions? Um, because it it's you know obviously going to the root of of that matter, even though it's on a bunch of different topics. I think, um, as an attorney, I'm going to take the the risk averse angle and tell you that mm -hmm. it depends on <laughs> what the language is of of the bills. But the question is a good one, particularly because, as you saw with the executive order that came out um, toward the toward the end of the Trump administration, it was really looking to target what DEI and to define that in a way that was incredibly broad. And the interesting thing about this is it was not only about public institutions. What we're seeing here is actually an effort to also go after private institutions. And you mentioned the training aspect of this, which is which is a critical part. It's not only that we're looking at higher education institutions or public institutions, we're also looking at private businesses and saying, well, you cannot conduct trainings on your premises as part of your HR or your company culture, whatever it is you want to call it, uh, in your own private entity. And I think it's really important to note that after the initial, I believe, I believe it was after the initial um, executive order came out, uh, 160 different trade associations and nonprofits, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, sent a letter to President Trump and said, you need to withdraw this because it's going to create confusion. It's going to create uncertainty and it's going to lead to non-meritorious investigations and hinder the mm -hmm. ability of employers to implement these, these programs. I think that kind of comes back to Mushtaq's point as well earlier about how equity in, and inclusion are, have really become at the fore of, of, any, of any academics classroom in order to ensure that there is that openness of inquiry and that, and that free exchange of ideas so that students can be exposed to different ideas and to learn from one another. 
You know, I, I think on the, the legal question, Sarah, it's a, it's a really good and hard question. You know, I think that there are some of these bills could potentially be challenged on their face because they're they're sort of facially invalid. I think we'll have to see how some of the application is is sort of carried out in the states because they could be some of these um, bills could be constitutional as applied. Um, you know, we've got state constitutional issues, we've got federal constitutional issues, right? Unlike with the federal executive orders where you can challenge sort of in one fell swoop at the federal level, right? If there are indeed 41 state bills, not that 41 will get passed, but, you know, mm -hmm. if there, are, there are several state bills, you know, you've got to really think about sort of a state by state litigation strategy, which is um, hard and complicated. And, you know, you could see some uneven results there. The other question I guess I have for you actually turning it back is, you know, I'm curious if you see any tension between what some of these states are promulgating and some federal guidance and direction, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a new Biden administration, I mean, are, do these state laws, the ones that you've tracked, do they seem to um, be able to be compatible with our rules around FSA and other ed, ed regulations? Or do we, are there places where there might be tension or do we not know? Well, you know, the the other executive order kind of related to this issue was one put out at the end of the Trump administration, also on free inquiry on college campuses. Um, and the Department of Education had actually moved forward to implement that. I think there were still some court cases maybe um, pending on it. Um, that, uh, you know, that rule is still standing at the Department of Education. And in fact, we know that the Biden administration is going to promulgate some new rules around free inquiry on our college campuses. Again, similar to the DEI one, it's tied to your ability to, to get federal funding. And so that's kind of how you get to the privates and the publics. But I think that there are members of Congress, especially, you know, Chairwoman Virginia Fox in the House, who is specifically interested in this and looking at these issues on a federal or a national level. And Nadine, I'm struck that you that 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 when you talk about these bills, there's also a piece of accountability in there, right? It's not just saying you can't teach CRT or you can't teach uh, a DEI course, you also have to have career readiness, right? The degree has to demonstrate that it's worthwhile, which is something that I think that there's a lot of bipartisan agreement on in trying to get accountability for institutions of higher education and, and understanding what a student is getting for their degree. And so in some ways, this seems like it's a more sophisticated conversation, right? They're not just saying you can't teach CRT, but they're also saying, but what are you teaching? And can you demonstrate that? And I think that that's also a change than say what we saw in the culture wars in the early 2000s, where there was this concern about multicultural and gender studies. And so I guess, Mushtaq, I would say it's it's something that we're watching really closely mm -hmm. um, as the 118th Congress um, kicks off. And, and I also think that there could be some bipartisan interest in looking at some of these things about what is being taught on our college campuses, M not maybe because they don't agree with free inquiry, but understanding kind of the value of higher education. May I comment on that quickly, Sarah? I think, I think you're making sure. a really important point. And I also would, would sound a note of caution because if you have an inquiry that says we're going to examine what's being taught on campuses, you could very well have a situation in which, like we saw in Wyoming last year, where the Senate actually voted to dismantle a gender studies department, finding that it did not have that that, that it did not teach something that was that was worth what the Senate thought should be being taught at, at the at the university right. level. Now it did not pass ultimately. And I will say there was a there was a bipartisan outcry against it from members of that governing body saying that this is really not our this is not our place and are we really the ones to say what is valuable and what is not. But I do worry that if these bills are interpreted in a way or if, if forthcoming efforts at the federal level are are stated in a, in a broad enough manner, you would have a situation mm -hmm. in which you have a legislator or a legislative body deciding what is valuable. And in the higher ed space, that really does give me pause from a from an academic freedom and free, an open free inquiry perspective. Yeah, so as a proud humanities 
graduate. Um, it, it concerns me also, you know, when I hear people say humanities degrees aren't worth it, um, they are worth it and they, they teach really important skills. English and philosophy right here. So yes, I'm right there with Great. you. <laughs> so um, Nadine, Sarah, um, heaven knows I'm miserable now. So uh, <laughs> what in the world are we going to do about this sort of going forward? Um, because uh, I feel like we've now identified what some of the threats are. Um, how are we thinking about tackling it? I would say the the first thing, and obviously this would be a little bit of a plug here, but but really PEN America is keeping up on these issues. We are, as I mentioned, we have a, an index, we are doing reporting. We want people to be educated about what is happening. And I would encourage people to first understand what the issues are. And of course, reach out to us um, with questions because this is something that as and unfortunately we're seeing, it really is a tide that is continuing to flow and we expect it to continue. So I would say first educate um, yourselves about what actually is happening in the space. And Nadine, I know this is like one of those issues where it takes a village, right? So yeah. um, we're so happy to be to be working with you. And I know um, our colleague Stephen Bloom has been very much engaged with PEN America in putting together like a resource guide that we're going to make available to um, institutions of higher education that talks about some of the good work already being done. And then obviously that we will be able to build on um, going into this year. But you know, I think that your your um, call to uh, people who are concerned with this issue to kind of educate themselves and learn about it. Are there any other resources you kind of want to mention to our audience or that we can link to? I know you you previously worked for the ACLU. Are there other groups that are very much engaged in this work? We are absolutely delighted to be working with you all um, as such leaders in this space, and it's really an honor to be collaborating on the guide and on other and other um, matters together. The ACLU does have resources as well as the AAUP, and I would encourage listeners to look at both of those um, guys to to be able to to learn more about what's happening and what they can do. Well, that's great, and we will definitely um, both link to available resources in our show notes. And I, I know that we are coming out with this resource guide um, in the coming weeks, and we will make sure that we plug it in future podcasts. You, Nadine, thank you so much for for being with us um, and for all of your work in this space. I think it will take, as Sarah says, a, a village. It will take all of us. I mean, I think it seems like it's going to take all of our listeners, all sort of working together sort of be able to help demonstrate the value of higher education, what's really happening on our campuses, and to be able to push back a little bit on some of these some of these bills to the extent that, um, you know, they, they get a little bit farther along in the process. But thank you so much, Nadine, for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. Absolutely my pleasure. As always, you can check out earlier episodes and subscribe to .edu on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. For show notes and links to the resources mentioned in the episode, you can go to our website at acenet.edu backslash podcast. While there, please take a short survey to let us know how we're doing. You can also email us at podcast at acenet.edu to give us suggestions on upcoming shows and guests. And finally, a very big thank you to the producers who helped pull this podcast together. Lori Arnston, Audrey Hamilton, Malcolm Moore, Anthony Trueheart, Rebecca Morris, Jack Nicholson, and Fatma Gom. They do an incredible job making this happen and making John Mushtaq and I sound as good as possible. Finally, thank you so much to all of you for listening. <laughs>